Welcome to the annual risk management training for Encompass Health Rehabilitation Hospital of Spring Hill. This presentation will be serving as the annual refresher for staff and contractors regarding risk management. This is a requirement of the state of Florida through the Agency of Healthcare Administration. Your expectation is that you will be watching this presentation in its entirety. If you are a contractor, please keep in mind some of the subject matter in this presentation will, although being related to you, you will not have access to the event reporting system and will require the assistance of a staff member to document any information. Thank you for your attention to this presentation. What is risk management? Risk management is a means to minimize risks for patients, visitors, and personnel by providing a safe environment. It is the goal of all employees of Encompass Health Spring Hill to provide a safe environment for all involved. A process that supports, maintains, and enhances the quality of patient care by preventing or decreasing the frequency and severity of adverse events. It's also an ongoing systematic process for loss prevention and control. Let's take a minute to talk about what that means. Most people who hear about loss prevention think of something like somebody who works at a store that prevents shoplifting, for example. There may be a secret shopper in plain clothes walking around the store who is ensuring and monitoring that nobody is actually taking anything from the store so the store does not have any losses as a result. In the hospital, we don't really worry about this. I don't know too many people who might want to steal a bedpan or a urinal. When we're talking about loss prevention at a hospital, what we're really talking about is making sure that we minimize adverse events and try to minimize the opportunity for legal ramifications for the hospital. For example, if someone develops a wound or if somebody has a fall with a major injury, this could open up the hospital for some liability. This is the type of loss prevention that we're referring to. The Florida Hospital Licensure Statute number 395 mandates that every licensed facility shall establish an internal risk management program. It needs to be managed by a healthcare risk manager and overseen by the facility's board of directors. At Encompass Health Spring Hill, the facility's board of directors is known as the governing body. They meet quarterly to be able to discuss opportunities for process improvement and any plans that are going on for this process improvement. The governing body delegates its authority for decision making and to make sure that reporting happens to the risk manager. The risk manager at Encompass Health Spring Hill is Amy Plunkett. The hospital's risk management program includes the following components. The investigation and analysis of the frequency and causes of general categories and specific types of adverse incidents to patients the development of appropriate measures to minimize the risk of adverse events to patients, and the analysis of patient grievances that relate to patient care and the quality of medical services. Let's talk about investigation and analysis for a minute. When you report something such as a fall, the information that, that you provide is then investigated to be able to kind of drill down as to what exactly was the causes and what things could we have had in place to prevent it. This is the investigation and analysis part. We also might develop measures through different committees to be able to be sure to be proactive in our approach. The analysis of patient grievances looks for things such as commonalities, for example, repetitive incidences like complaints about showers or complaints about room changes, things like that. What are the responsibilities of the risk manager? The risk manager is responsible for reporting to the Agency for Healthcare Administration, most of you are familiar with the term ACA, all adverse events that caused harm or may have caused harm to a patient. All healthcare workers have an affirmative legal duty to report adverse incidents to patients. Once a year, the risk manager compiles a list of all events or potential events based on the reporting from the incident reporting system and reports this to the Agency for Healthcare Administration. 
What do you do when an adverse event occurs? First and foremost, you need to take care of the patient or the visitor or whoever the affected person is. Make sure that the patient receives any immediate medical care necessary. You need to notify the physician if the patient is injured or if there's a need for a physician exam or new treatment orders. Even if the patient isn't injured, in a situation such as an adverse event, a physician should be notified so they're aware of any potential plans that need to change in their plan of care as a result of the event. You need to complete an event report and review it with your supervisor. If you have any questions, they can help you. Lastly, and very importantly, you need to notify the risk manager and the administrator on call immediately if it's a serious event. No one expects you to have x-ray vision. Nobody can see if somebody has a fracture, but if something tells you that this is a serious event, put a call out. Better to be safe than sorry. Accurate and timely event reporting is the communication link between the risk manager and facility staff such as yourself that allows for the investigation and analysis of adverse events to patients and other occurrences which may cause harm or financial loss. At Encompass Health Spring Hill, on each desktop, you will see a yellow triangle shown here that says risk management. We'll go into further detail on how to put in event reports later in this presentation. Let's start with what is an event report? Encompass Health defines an event as any happening not consistent with the routine care or operation of the facility or the desired routine care of the patient and or operation of the facility, which places our patients and visitors at increased risk for harm and the company at an increased risk for liability. Let's talk about that for a minute. For example, if someone's doing a lab draw and the patient develops a bruise, this is not an abnormal event. Typically, a lot of people do get bruising after a lab draw. However, if during a lab draw, the patient has a skin tear after the tourniquet is removed, this is not an expected outcome, and this would classify as an event. If it's not in the normal course of your day, fill out an event report. So let's talk about event reports. What is an event report? An event report is a written description, factual and non-judgmental, of an event that caused an injury or had the potential to cause an injury. Just because we catch it doesn't mean we don't fill out an event report because we don't want it to happen again where it does cause injury. It is used to document any extraordinary event, one that is a marked deviation from the routine. Again, if it's not normal, fill one out. Why do we do these event, uh, report events? Why do we do that? Well, number one, to provide safer care. We learn from actual events, but also gain valuable information from near misses and unsafe conditions. For example, a lot of you have heard of look-alike, sound-alike drugs, and you know that we don't put clonidine and clonopin in the same drawer in the Pixis. Why don't we do that? Because through event reporting in the past, we noted commonalities in some of the processes. And when people were giving the wrong drugs, it was because they were next to each other in the Pixis. Now, because of those event reports, we have processes in place that we no longer put look-alike, sound-alike drugs together. We also may flag them to say it's a look-alike, sound-alike drug to help to avoid future events. Why else do we report them? Well, we need a record of the event. We need to document the facts of the event. Our memories fade quickly. Our shifts are filled with tons of new information minute by minute. And the quicker that you can document it and get the information in, the more information we have to process what happened with this event. We need to provide a base from which a further complete investigation can be performed. Think of yourself as Picasso. If you draft an event report that has so much information that I can picture as the risk manager, what happened, how it happened, what you heard and what you saw, it makes it a lot easier to be able to investigate the situation and hopefully prevent an event like this from occurring in the future. Lastly, 
It's to provide a means of refreshing memories. If later a file manager or the risk manager comes to you to question you about the event, you will have a base for yourself to help to refresh your memory. Wow, that was two days ago. Was that alarm sounding? If you wrote it down, it'll already be there for you. That's why we report events. Who reports an event and when? The individual who has the best knowledge of the event, somebody who witnessed the event or received a report from the patient about the event, should be the person to enter the report into the event reporting system whenever possible. Your supervisor or a coworker or your risk manager can assist you if you're unsure or have never done it before, but don't ever be afraid to report. Be sure to report the event immediately after discovery. Delays cause the facts to become cloudy and accuracy could be questioned. When in doubt, fill one out. How should an event report be completed? Remember, just the facts, ma'am. Describe precisely what transpired, what actions were taken at the time and by whom. Remember we were talking about Picasso. Help to paint a picture of the entire event to your knowledge. Answer questions like, what did you see? What did you hear? What did you smell? Use your senses to document what those things were. For example, when you walked into the room and you found the patient on the floor, did you hear an alarm sounding? If you didn't, you can document that too so that later when questioned, you'll have that information. Make objective statements. You wanna be accurate and concise. Always report honestly. Include the names and addresses of witnesses. We'll go into that detail a little later. Patient statements, you can record these as direct quotations. For example, again, if you find a patient on the floor, Mrs. Jones, what happened? And she states, I was trying to get to the bathroom and I tripped. If you put that in quotations, that again helps to paint the picture for those who will be investigating after the event is filled out. We read these reports. Your information is important. Do not come to any conclusions, make assumptions, opinions, or unfounded statements of any kind. These are not pertinent to the event report. In fact, in the event report, it even asks for a brief factual description. It doesn't say what happened. It says brief factual description. Never draw a conclusion or offer opinions about culpability, liability, or error. Don't place blame and don't include any recommendations, suggestions, or advice. If you do want to further discuss it, please reach out to your supervisor or to the risk manager. Never ever document in the chart or the medical record that an event report was completed, nor should you tell a patient or a family member that you will be filling out a report or that a report was completed. This is important because the quality process is protected information, meaning it can't be subpoenaed for a lawsuit. The reason that's important is so that companies and hospitals truly report honestly in the event reporting system and are able to freely be able to investigate and actually do process improvement. If they were afraid of every single thing that was in the event reporting system getting into the wrong hands, they may not report honestly. And the problem with that is we can't fix it if we don't know it's broke. So always, always report honestly and never document in the chart or talk to patients and families that you completed a report. Where should events be reported? Look for the risk icon on your desktop, tablet, or laptop. This icon is the portal to the event reporting system. To access the system, simply log in using your Encompass Health credentials, your normal username and password, or if you wish to report anonymously, click on the Submit Anonymously link under the Login button instead. There are additional ways to utilize the event reporting system and to access the portal. 
These include from the home page of Encompass Health 360. You can scroll to the bottom of the page and click on the RISC logo. Click on the event reporting tab and finally click on the report a patient or visitor event button. From the home page toolbar, choose home office services, risk management, and then click on the event reporting tab. Finally, click on the report a patient or visitor event button. These are not the best ways to report an event. The best way is from your desktop, laptop, or tablet directly utilizing your username and password. It ensures it gets to the right hospital and it's investigated timely. What do you do when an event occurs? As soon as possible, but of course, after attending to the patient, log into the event reporting system, as we talked about on the last slide, use your Encompass Health username and password, and select the general type of event that occurred. We'll be discussing various event types in the next few slides. Complete all mandatory and relevant information fields stating facts, and enclosing patient or witness statements in quotation marks. Submit the form. Answer the questions from file managers and or the DQR as they arise. Now let's talk a little about the event reporting system itself. The event reporting system is known as RL6. You'll be connected to RL6 as soon as you click on the yellow icon on your desktop. After either logging in or clicking on the Submit Anonymously link, a welcome message will appear, followed by the icon wall screen below. You click on the icon for the type of event you wish to report, or simply type in the event and the correct icon will appear. These icons are referred to as general event types. Depending on the general event type chosen, the question fields within it will pertain to that type of event only. For example, if you click on the fall general event type, you're not going to get questions about incorrect medications like you would if you clicked on one of the medication ones. There's certain common form information that's in, available in all of the general event types. For example, when and where the event occurred, the type of person affected, whether inpatient, outpatient, or visitor, general information about the event, a witnesses section, and an attachment section. Fields marked with a green asterisk are mandatory. The form will not submit if mandatory fields are not complete. The left side of the screen shows a file status, meaning how many fields and how many mandatory fields have been completed and how many remain. You can check this to see how many mandatory fields ha you have completed to ensure you've done them all. Hovering over a question or answer choice may produce a pop-up box with more information. There are various types of forms and their uses, and now we will discuss some of them. Adverse drug event is used when a patient experiences harm caused by the drug at normal doses during normal use. For example, if a patient starts a new medication and a rash occurs, you may use an adverse drug event form in order to document that there was an adverse drug event. And of course, you would notify the physician. Medication fluid is used when there's an inconsistency between the drug ordered and the drug administered, like our clonidine clonopin situation. The fall form is one that many of you are familiar with. You want to use this form when there's a patient or a visitor fall. Skin tissue is used when a patient is noted to have impaired skin, skin integrity. This is not used just for hospital acquired wounds. It could be a skin tear or a burn. It's important to initiate a skin tissue event report when any alteration in skin integrity develops. Hospital acquired infection form is used when the patient develops an infection or is exposed to a communicable disease in your hospital. For example, a patient that is newly diagnosed with C. diff that has been with our hospital for many days may need to have a hospital acquired infection form filled out. 
You can speak to the infection preventionist if you're not sure if this form should be initiated. The equipment malfunction form is used when no patient was involved in the event or if a patient was involved, no injury resulted to the patient. For example, if a patient is using a walker and the wheel falls off, but the patient is not injured, you may want to use the equipment malfunction form. Treatment, procedure, or provision of care form is used when there's a deviation in a procedure, treatment, therapy, or other provision of care. This one is also very popularly used. There are many, many instances where this form could be used. It could be a patient was given an incorrect diet. It could be that a patient failed to have a procedure for, performed for whatever reason. It's important that you utilize this form and explore it. The testing form is used when there's a problem with how a test was ordered, how the collection or study was performed, or with the communication of results. If, for example, we never got lab results on a test, it's important to use the testing form. We'll now talk about documenting when and where the event occurred. After you hit the general event type and go to the specific type, you will be asked to enter the event date and the incident time, as well as the facility. The facility state and region fields will auto-populate for you unless you work at more than one hospital. If you work at more than one hospital, the report will default to your home hospital. The department to investigate will give you various choices. Depending on what type of event it is, you would choose what, the, what you believe the appropriate department to investigate is. For example, if it is a fall that occurred in the gym, you may want to put that therapy will investigate. If it's a blood draw that was incorrectly performed, you may want to have nursing investigate. Do your best. The specific location could be picked from the patient room. And how was the event discovered? This is one that comes sometimes gets a little tricky. The choices there are person reporting was involved or present. In other words, you were there when it happened. Patient self-reported. You didn't see it, but the patient told you about it. Last night I fell. That would be an example of patient self-reported the staff nurse had not already reported to you that this had happened. Patient visitor reported. You did not see it, but a family member or visitor told you about it. Oh, I was helping to transfer my mom in the bathroom and she fell. Staff reported, but not involved present. You didn't see it, but another staff member told you about it. Assessment after the event. It was discovered after you assessed the patient. For instance, you may see a skin tear when you're doing your morning assessment that there's no record of. This would be an example of assessment after event. Review of record or chart. You discovered it after a review of the patient's record or chart. The person affected field gives you various options on what type of person experienced the event. This could be an inpatient, outpatient, visitor, no person, or other, which would be for volunteers or vendors or students from one of the other schools. After you select the type of person affected, if it's for an inpatient, you will have the opportunity to do a search and auto-populate an awful lot of information, which will save you a lot of time and effort. To do this, select inpatient as the type of person affected and put in the person's last name. Although not shown here, to the left of the last name box, there will be a little magnifying glass. Once you enter the person's last name, click on the magnifying glass and a patient search box will pop up as seen here. The patient can be located also by either MRN account number or last name if you don't want to use just the last name. Once you enter this information in, click the search button and the patient's name should choose. Once you verify you have the right patient, you will go ahead and select that patient and many fields will auto-populate for you, including the patient's diagnosis, their sex, 
their address, telephone number, etc. This will save you a lot of inform information seeking behavior. Next is the general information. You're going to enter a specific event type, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Whether or not an injury occurred, what was the, whether or not the doctor was notified and the date and time that the doctor was notified, whether or not the family was notified of the event, whether or not any equipment malfunction contributed to the event, and then that brief factual description that we talked about earlier. Remember, in brief factual description, you want to state the facts of the event. Remember to enclose patients or other statements in quotation marks. For example, the patient's wife said, quote, my husband fell off the side of the bed, end quote. This is also the area that you will enter what you see and what you hear, like we talked about earlier. So you could start it off this way. The patient's wife said, quote, my husband fell off the side of the bed, end quote. No alarm was noted to be sounding. Patient stated, quote, I was trying to go to the bathroom, end quote. This is all opportunities to, to document the facts accurately and timely. There will also be choices for potential contributing factors, such as maybe patient cognition, and what immediate actions you took, such as first aid, etc. Now let's talk about specific event types. Most all general event types contain a specific event type field. This field provides a means of drilling down further into the specific event you are reporting within that form. For example, within the fall form, the specific event type field provides answer choices such as from bed, lying in bed, from bed, sitting on the side, from chair, from wheelchair, from equipment, etc. This gives us an opportunity when we're doing our investigation to find out where our falls are happening from. Are most of our falls falling from the commode? What are we doing about that? This level of detail allows us to learn where falls are occurring from most often. Similarly, within the medication fluid form, the specific event type field provides answer choices such as contraindicated because of drug disease, contraindicated drug to drug, contraindicated drug to food, contraindicated known allergy, dose incorrect, etc. Please read the choices carefully as they may not seem as obvious to you until you read them all. Again, this level of detail allows us to learn why medication events are occurring. This type of data collection can help us prevent these events from happening in the future. You will see that other general event types will contain choices in the specific event type pick list that are unique to the type of event being reported. This is all to make it easier for you. Witnesses. The importance of witnesses cannot be stressed enough. To, to add witnesses, click on the add button underneath witnesses and enter information about anyone who witnessed the event. If the witness is a visitor, ask if they, are right, if they are willing to share their contact information. The person completing the report should not enter his or her information in this section unless you are the only person who witnessed the event. Please enter it there if you are. Many people ask me about adding witnesses to unwitnessed falls. It sounds a little strange, but we previously had a survey where Aka was in the building and Asked, asked us why we did not have any witnesses listed for unwitnessed falls. Obviously, there was nobody who witnessed the patient fall. But think about it for a minute. There are witnesses to the at least the aftermath of the event. If we're looking to obtain information about how this happened, we definitely need to know who was there after the event. If we call a fall huddle and four people show up, each person may see something differently or notice something that was, that's important during the investigation. One person may notice that the lights weren't on. One person may notice that the patient's phone was out of reach. Third person may notice that an alarm was sounding. All of these witnesses are, have key information to the event, even though they didn't directly witness the event. Please be sure every event report has a witness included. 
Lastly, when entering witnesses, under classification of party, you can click on Encompass Health Staff for anyone who does work here, and then just put their name in and their job title. However, if you have a visitor or a family member, please be sure to also enter the address and telephone number so that if they need to be contacted and further investigation needs to be done, it can be done without a lot of effort and further investigation. So like we talked about, who's a witness? A witness is anyone who has knowledge of the event. This may seem repetitive, but it was very important because the Agency for Healthcare Administration requires that we have witnesses for all of our event reports. Be sure to advise the risk manager of any reluctant witnesses by alerting your supervisor immediately. Patient and family notification. All adverse incidents with patient injury must be reported to the patient and to the family if the patient agrees to the notification. So for example, when a patient falls, you can say, did you want me to call your daughter? The patient has a right to refuse if they have capacity, and you can document this in the post-fall assessment and in the event report. Otherwise, if the patient gives consent, please be sure to notify the patient's family and document that you did. All notifications should be reflected on event reports to include the name of the individual notified, the method, and the time of notification. If unable to reach a family member, document that a message was left at a specific phone number. And the individual who does the notification should document the information conveyed and the party's response in the medical record. One more reminder though, do not document in the medical record that an event report was filled out. If necessary, reports can be saved as incomplete. This should be a rare occurrence. It would be helpful to you if you're interrupted or need to go and gather more information to complete the report, because once the report is submitted, you no longer have access to add any additional information. In order to save the report as incomplete, hover over the More Actions tab at the bottom of the page and choose the option Save as Incomplete. Be sure to go back into the event report prior to the end of that shift to complete the information you were holding on and hit the submit button. The event report is not considered submitted until the submit button has been pressed and the risk manager has been notified. Once you've completed all mandatory fields, you will be ready to submit your report. As mentioned, the submit button is located at the bottom right hand side of the page in green. The Agency for Healthcare Administration requires that we report any adverse events, serious adverse events, such as fractures or dislocations of bones or joints, anything that results in a limitation of neurological, physical, or sensory function, or any condition that requires specialized medical attention or surgical intervention. Incidences such as this are referred to by ACA as a Code 15. The risk manager needs to be notified of immediately of any severe adverse events so that the initiation of a code 15 can be done. The investigation and all documentation by the risk manager, including a, risk, a root cause analysis, needs to be completed within 15 days so it can be submitted to the Agency for Healthcare Administration. The Joint Commission refers to severe injuries such as this as a sentinel event. A sentinel event is an unexpected occurrence that involves death, major loss of function, not related to the natural course of the patient's illness or underlying condition. In other words, if the patient comes in because they had a hip fracture and then ultimately dies from complications of that hip fracture, non-event related, that would not be a sentinel event. However, if a patient falls and breaks their hip, that would be considered a major event and would have to be reported. This is not for your concern, meaning you would not have to be reporting to the Joint Commission, but it is really important that the risk manager is made aware of any major serious events with serious outcomes. Again, examples of a sentinel event 
include death as a result of medical misadventure, brain or spinal damage, permanent disfigurement, suicide or attempted suicide while at the facility. All of these things require a root cause analysis conducted by the risk manager and must be reported as a code 15 to ACCA. You may be asked to participate in a root cause analysis. This is a meeting whereby staff get together and go over the events of whatever event occurred. We need to go over things such as what was the normal process, was the process followed, and what really caused what happened to happen, and how could this have been preventable. So don't get nervous if you're asked to participate in a root cause analysis. Many of you are familiar after this year with surveys and inspections. The Joint Commission, OSHA, ACA, and other federal, state, or local agencies may come and visit with us. Remember to notify hospital leadership immediately if a surveyor or inspector visits the facility. Always answer questions truthfully every time. Sometimes the truth requires a simple, I'm not sure, but I know how to find out. And it may require you looking up a policy, talking to your supervisor or a member of the management team. Don't ever hesitate to ask for help. Another part of risk management is abuse and neglect prevention. Reporting potential abuse and neglect and also investigations related to allegations of abuse and neglect. The Department of Children and Families Abuse Hotline is 1-800-96-ABUSE. The abuse hotline investigates allegations of physical, sexual, and mental abuse, neglect, and exploitation of vulnerable persons. Everyone has an obligation to report suspected abuse. Please remember, it's not your job to investigate whether or not something is plausible. If a patient reports it, we need to go ahead and, and start the needs of that investigation. Please don't call the abuse hotline without speaking to a supervisor and the risk manager so you have the support you need to be able to go through this process. Remember, it's all of our jobs to protect our patients. In the case of an allegation of abuse, the risk manager must investigate every allegation of sexual misconduct, which is made against a member of the facility's personnel who has direct patient contact report every allegation of sexual misconduct to the administrator of the licensed hospital and notify risk management. Notify the family or guardian of the victim that an allegation of sexual misconduct has been made and that an investigation is being conducted. We need to report to the Department of Health and ACA every allegation of sexual misconduct and to the respective practice board of a licensed healthcare practitioner to be involved and the risk manager needs to notify the police. How does the risk manager do that? By you reporting to the risk manager and your supervisor very quickly any allegation of abuse, neglect, or misappropriation. It does not need to be of a sexual nature. Any abuse needs to be reported. Each year, the national patient safety goals are introduced by the Joint Commission. Any staff member may report quality of care or safety issues to the Joint Commission if they see any. Over 100,000 people die each year from errors in hospitals. By following the National Patient Safety Goals, you can decrease the number of deaths nationwide and prevent life-threatening errors in our facility. The National Patient Safety Goals include improving the accuracy of patient identification. Now, how do we do that? Well, we have an EMR system which helps us to scan the patient and the medication to ensure that the patient is receiving the right medication. We ask them their name and date of birth and compare it to our MAR and to the patient bracelet. Another patient safety goal is to improve the effectiveness of communication among caregivers. How do we do that? We do bedside reporting or handoff between departments, improving the safety of using medications. We make sure that we use the five routes of administration when we're giving medications to ensure that we're doing things the right way each time. Reduce the harm associated with clinical alarm systems. We respond to alarms timely. We ensure that they're functioning and present and that the need for alarms is identified 
by assessment with each patient. Reduce the risk of healthcare associated infections. How do we prevent that? How do we help reduce the healthcare infections? We wash our hands. We use prop proper PPE. The hospital identifies safety risks inherent to its patient population. Our patient population is very, very high at risk for falls based on age and functional status. Those risks are identified and we, we, we educate on them and work together to help to minimize them. And then lastly, the universal protocol for preventing wrong site, wrong procedure, and wrong person surgery. Fortunately, at a Compass Health Spring Hill, we are not conducting any surgeries and this would not be applicable in our building. Remember, the National Patient Safety Goals by the Joint Commission are on your badge. If you're ever asked or need to look at them, they are right there for you. Remember, you should also know not only what the goals are, but how we, pre how we help to prevent and encourage goal this from happening. Please remember you have help. The CEO, the Director of Quality and Risk, your manager, any of the senior team members, any of our supervisors, leads, or just a preceptor, any of us are here to help you, whether you're a new employee or one who's been here for years. We need to work together as a team and be stronger together. There are multiple quality and risk goals within the hospital, but mainly remember that we want to minimize the risk for patients, visitors, and staff by providing a safe environment, and we want to support, maintain, and enhance the quality of patient care. We all do this every day. How many of you have never heard a complaint from a patient or a family member? I can't see you, but I assume that all of you have heard at some time some sort of a concern or a complaint. When I teach orientation, I've never had anybody raise their hand to that question. Everyone plays a part in helping to listen to complaints and report them. Notify your manager if something doesn't feel right. Patient complaints and grievances are a responsibility of everyone in the hospital. There is a difference between patient complaints and patient grievances. As part of our orientation, we will review the patient grievance policy number eight. Remember, there are two categories of patient complaints, patient complaints and patient grievances. Not all complaints rise to the level of a grievance. For example, if the issue meets all of the following criteria, it is considered a complaint and does not require a written response. If the issue is of a minor nature, such as needing the bed changed, housekeeping issues, room temperature, or serving preferred food and beverages, or the noise level. Additionally, the issue cannot be a recurring issue for it to be considered a complaint versus a grievance. The issue needs to be able to be resolved by the present staff. That can include any hospital staff, nursing, clinical leadership, administration, the patient advocate, and et cetera, that was present at the time of the complaint or who can quickly be at the patient's location to resolve the complaint. And lastly, the patient needs to be satisfied with the actions taken. A complaint is considered resolved when the patient is satisfied with the actions taken on their behalf. Let's explore a complaint for a minute. If you walk into a room and the patient is complaining that their breakfast is cold, all of us have an obligation to address this concern. What could we do about that? We could offer to heat up the meal for them. We could offer to call the kitchen to get them a different meal. There are plenty of solutions that we could do to resolve this complaint immediately to the satisfaction of the patient. Patient grievances are an escalated level of complaint. Any complaint that meets any of the following criteria are considered grievances and require a written response. If the complaint is received in writing, it is always considered a grievance. Be sure to turn any written complaint immediately to your supervisor. 
a complaint regarding the patient's care, or with any allegation of abuse, neglect, patient harm, or failure of the hospital to comply with one or more of the conditions of participation or other CMS requirements. If the complaint cannot be resolved at the time of the complaint by staff present, is postponed for later resolution, is referred to other staff for later resolution, or requires an investigation or further actions for resolution, this would be considered a grievance. Patient or the patient's representative is not satisfied with the previous actions taken. And lastly, if the patient or the patient's representative requests that his or her complaint be handled as a formal complaint or grievance, or when the patient requests a response from the hospital, the complaint is considered a grievance. In the earlier example, with the heated food, if the patient has her food heated up, but indicates that every single day her food arrives cold, this would be considered a grievance. It is important that we escalate grievances to the appropriate department head for resolution. For example, management may be able to assist in getting the patient's food being sent on the first tray, the first cart, or requesting that staff deliver the patient's food first. All of these cannot be resolved immediately and take further planning and therefore would be considered a grievance. It is everyone's responsibility, as previously said, to resolve concerns immediately to the best of their ability. It is also everyone's responsibility to enter complaints and grievances into the ECOM system. We will go over in detail the ECOM system as this was just initiated recently, and we want to ensure that staff feel comfortable to be able to enter the concerns into the system. Remember, COM stands for compose, apologize, listen, and make it right. It's important that when we're addressing concerns, we think about it that way. We need to compose ourselves and be ready to truly hear what the patient has to say and what the true concern is. We should always apologize. It may not be something that we ourselves did, but we need to apologize for how the patient is feeling and for the event as it occurred. We need to listen. Listening is sometimes one of the most challenging things. Sometimes we assume that we know what the patient is saying, but it's because we're not always listening to everything that they say. And then we need to make it right. We need to heat up the food. We need to adjust the temperature in the room or get them a warm blanket. But if it's something that can't be resolved immediately and is an ongoing problem, we need to escalate it to the right people to ensure that we can get the problem fixed in the long run. After entering a concern into ECOM, it's important to notify the appropriate department head that a complaint was entered. This may go to the director of therapy, the nursing supervisor, the environmental su services supervisor, the dietary manager, or the director of case management. And of course, the director of quality and risk management is always available as well. You can notify them of the entrance into ECOM via Skype, telephone, or in person. Just let them know it's there so that they can go ahead and address it quickly and resolve the issue for the patient and or family member. On everyone's desktop, there is an icon that says ECOM. When you click on that, it will show you the screen that is shown here in blue and white. You would click on New Hospital Complaint and Grievance, and that will open a form and enable you to be able to enter the information that you need to in order to make sure that the patient's concern is not only recorded, but addressed. How do I enter a complaint? Once you enter the ECOM system, you will see the following screen. You would enter the date that the complaint was raised along with the time. Please note that the time defaults in central time 
and you will need to use the drop down menu to change it to Eastern Standard Time. You would then enter the patient name and who the complaint was raised by. For example, if it was raised by the patient, you would not need to fill in the box. You could just check the patient button next to the word patient. However, if the complaint was raised by the spouse, you would fill in the spouse's name and click family member. Next, you see received via. That would be either verbal, telephone, or in person. Continuing on in the forum, there is an opportunity for you to check what the concern involves. Is it related to the admission process? Is the patient claiming that we might have said something and made a promise upon admission? That is when we would click the admission box. Cleanliness housekeeping, discharge, equipment, food, diet, general care, lost personal items, medication related, patient safety, professionalism and respect, response time to call light, room environment or temperature, and sleep noise. And it also gives you an opportunity to click other if none of these categories seems to apply. Next, you would click the relevant departments. You can click more than one. For example, if they're complaining about their room not being clean and their tray table being cluttered and the closet things not being put in the closet, you may ch check housekeeping and nursing as these two departments work together to ensure the rooms are clean. The next box is one of the most important, description of complaint. It is very important that we express the complaint but utilize this in a professional manner. We can use descriptive words such as the patient was angry or the patient was upset, but we don't want to use words that may be inappropriate language that the patient may have utilized. The next sections are optional. If you had a concern such as with the food not being heated up, where it says who responded, you can actually put your name and the action taken would be heated up meal. Although that doesn't resolve the long-term concern, it does resolve the immediate concern. And then others can go ahead and add additional actions taken later on. After this is entered, you would click the green submit button in the bottom right-hand corner and then notify the appropriate department head that there's a concern in Ecom. There is no need to give them extensive detail as they will be able to review Ecom, and if they have any questions, they would be able to reach out to you. What quality indicators do we measure? At Encompass Health Spring Hill, we monitor many, many things. Why do we do this? We want to be able to identify areas of opportunity for process improvement. Some of the indicators are our ability to handle patient grievances and satisfaction, results from medical record audits, percentage of staff completing corporate compliance training, and our hand hygiene compliance. These are just a few. We monitor many, many things throughout the committees in the hospital, up to and including the Quality Council, the Medical Executive Committee, and the governing body. We will now go and have a refresher regards to our fall prevention program. <clears throat> Falls are the leading cause of injury related death for those 65 years of age or older. In addition to premature death, Falls can lead to other severe consequences. This could include femur fractures, traumatic brain injury, or fear of falling. Many people ask me why fear of falling is included with such severe consequences, such as a femur fracture or a traumatic brain injury. Remember, we work in rehabilitation. Fear of falling is a true barrier to the success of the patient in outcomes in therapy. If a patient is afraid to transfer out of bed 
or afraid to walk in the gym, this could cause a major barrier to their ability to function at home. All patients will be assessed pre-admission, on admission, and throughout hospitalization for their level of fall risk. Encompass Health has introduced a fall risk model that encompasses many, many categories and assists with identifying patients at higher risk for falls. Fall risk levels are aligned with our fall precaution definitions, including high, basic, and standard precautions. Clinical judgment can always elevate risk. We utilize the fall risk model as a tool, but it is never a substitution for clinical judgment. The fall risk model is composed of more than 50 contributing factors. We will discuss some of these factors on the next slide. With this model, there are features that increase risk as well as decrease risk, a way to balance the model. We are focused on those features that increase the risk. The model is, most, is designed to be most predictive for a first fall. If a patient falls while in our hospital, we will always maintain them at a high risk for another fall. Some of the contributing factors for the fall risk model include the patient's diagnosis, medications that the patient is taking, physical and cognitive as well as behavioral function of the patient, vital signs and lab test results, as well as other assessments, such as whether or not the patient has previously fallen, whether they're continent, their appetite, and their Braden score. As previously mentioned, there are three levels of fall precautions. These are standard, basic, and high. All new admissions will be implemented into the high risk category. That means on admission, all patients should have an activated bed alarm, a chair alarm placed in the room, a self-releasing alarm wheelchair belt, supervision in the bathroom signs, the falling star magnet, and the fall wristband. Remember, patients should be assessed for their ability to utilize the self-releasing alarm wheelchair belt and documented whether or not the patient is able to release the belt on their own. Remember, the striker bed built-in alarm will be used. There should not be a pad or alarm box utilized with the striker bed alarm. We will use the center zone. The chair alarm and pad will not be used on wheelchairs, only on straight armchairs or recliners. The self-releasing belt will be used on wheelchairs. The patient will be assessed in the first couple of days of their stay. Nursing conducts an admission assessment and therapy will complete their evaluations on day two. There will be a collaboration after the therapy evaluations are complete to determine if the measures need to continue, be reduced or be enhanced as soon as the initial evals are completed with appropriate changes made into the medical record. Remember, Fall precautions are no longer all or nothing. We can pick or choose after the completed evaluations on day two. Prior to that, all new admits are considered high fall risk and get the full package. Reevaluation of the patient should be conducted at a minimum of on admission, on any unit transfer, following any change of status, following a fall, and weekly at a minimum. Typically, the weekly fall assess reassessment is conducted at or right before team conference. The At Risk for Falls Interdisciplinary Plan of Care, or IPOC, will be triggered in the medical record for every patient upon admission. Interventions and goals will be determined based on the risk level and individualized to the patient's needs. As therapy sessions progress, indicating the need for additional goals and intervention, they will be added to the FALLS IPOC. This plan can be modified by an RN, PT, OT, or SLP at any time during the stay based on the determination of a need for change. Basic and high-level precautions 
are updated utilizing the modification of the order. I cannot stress enough that all patients are considered high risk on admission. One of the first things that should be implemented as soon as the patient is brought into their room is the falls risk precautions. This sign will be completed by therapy and placed on the bathroom door. All staff should utilize this as a communication tool to be able to identify the best way and safest way to transfer patients while toileting and showering. OT will be responsible for updating this and keeping it up to date, and all staff are responsible for referencing it when transferring and assisting patients. Unfortunately, all of the interventions do not prevent all falls. When a patient falls, there are key elements of the post-fall procedures that must happen. Number one, call a fall huddle. Pick up the room phone and dial star seven and repeat three times fall huddle and your location. For example, fall huddle 103B, fall huddle 103B, fall huddle 103B. Although that seems repetitive, remember staff are busy assisting other patients and may not hear you, which is why we have made the process to repeat this three times. We want to make sure that you and the patient get the help you need timely. A fall, post fall huddle should be conducted with the minima of the supervisor, respiratory therapy, the primary nurse, and the tech assigned to the patient. If in the gym, therapists may also participate, and if therapists are available, it is encouraged that they participate in the post-fall huddle that occurs in the patient room. The physician should be notified within an hour and orders should be entered into the medical record. Documentation and follow-up should be completed, including an event report. When a patient falls, you will complete the initial post-fall assessment. This post-fall assessment can be completed by any licensed personnel licensed to assess. This includes a registered nurse, a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, or a speech language pathologist. The first priority is to assist the patient, assess the patient for any obvious injuries and find out what happened. Licensed clinicians, as mentioned before, complete the post-fall assessment form in ACIT. Remember, all areas that are highlighted in green must be completed in order for the form to be considered. When a patient falls, the family should also be notified if the patient has given us permission. Case management should be notified, as well as therapy, and all documentation should be completed. Be sure also to notify the nursing supervisor. Fall prevention is everyone's responsibility. Working together will help us to assure that patients are safe at all times. The entire hospital team answers bed and wheelchair alarms and should not pass any alarm at any time. The falls policy is number 677. In the policy, a fall is defined as an unintentional change in position coming to rest on the ground, floor, or onto the next lower surface, such as a bed, chair, or bedside mat. Note the word unintentional. We have had situations where we walk into a room and the patient is on the floor and they say, oh, I got down because I was trying to get my slippers. They didn't fall, they intentionally got down there. Although they couldn't get up, this would not be considered a fall. The fall may be witnessed, reported by the patient or an observer, or identified when a patient is found on the floor or ground. Falls are not a result of an overwhelming external force, such as a patient pushes another patient. Remember, Intercepted falls are considered a fall per our falls policy. An intercepted fall occurs when the patient would have fallen if he or she had not caught him or herself or had not been intercepted by another person. 
An intercepted fall is still considered a fall. There are three subcategories of intercepted falls. The patient is lowered to the next lower surface, such as the chair or the bed. The patient is lowered to the floor, or the patient doesn't need to be lowered. On the previous slide, we discussed one of the two subcategories of falls, the intercepted fall. The other type of subcategory of a fall is an unwitnessed fall. That is a type of fall that is unobserved by staff, including falls reported by the patient, family, or another patient or visitor. It's now time to test your knowledge. An employee is walking past a patient room and sees a patient in the process of falling. They intervene just in time to lower the patient to the bed. No injury occurs. Is this considered a fall, an intercepted fall, an unwitnessed fall, an unsafe condition, or a near miss? This would be considered an intercepted fall. An intercepted fall occurs when a patient would have fallen but for the intervention of staff. A patient had a fall resulting in a hip fracture and an acute care transfer. A fall report was completed in the event reporting system. Which of the following is true about documentation of the fall in the medical record? Falls should never be documented in the medical record. Any adverse event that reaches the patient and impacts their well-being, care plan, or medical condition must be documented in the medical record. Document the facts of the event. Falls should not be reported in both the medical record and in the incident reporting system. None of the above is true. Let's think. Great work. Any adverse event that reaches the patient and impacts their well being, care plan, or medical condition must be documented in the medical record. Document the facts of the event. A patient becomes dizzy and clammy after therapy. The patient is brought back into the room and given orange juice and crackers since he's allergic to peanuts and milk. His blood sugar was checked and the result was 45. The patient was alert and oriented and was able to communicate appropriately moments later. What's the most appropriate form to record this event and how do you classify this episode? Safety and security, other. Treatment procedure, provision of care, allergic reaction. Treatment procedure, provision of care, dietary, incorrect diet. Treatment procedure, provision of care, onset of hypoglycemia during care, or good catch, near miss. Great job. The treatment procedure provision of care onset of hypoglycemia during care is the proper form to fill out. It doesn't get much more specific than that. Patient's dentures and glasses are missing. She said she is going to sue us if we don't replace the items. What's the most appropriate way to report this? Treatment procedure provision of care other. Treatment procedure provision of care ID missing or incorrect. Safety security event, patient visitor damage loss theft. Safety security event, threat of violence. NA, report to the compliance hotline instead. Great job. The safety security event, patient visitor damage loss theft icon should be utilized. Remember, it may not hurt when something's missing to search for the items first to ensure that they are actually missing before filling out the event report. Additionally, you may want to place a call to the supervisor or to the risk manager to alert them that the patient is looking for the glasses so that we can look for them as fast as possible. Over the Christmas holiday, a patient's family members came in for a celebration and brought alcohol with them. Staff tried addressing the issue with the family and asked that all alcohol be removed from the premises at once. They were non-compliant and they, along with the patient, were drinking alcohol, yelling at staff and not allowing them to enter the room to provide care for the patient. Should an event report be submitted? 
Yes, on the safety security form as a disorderly person. Yes, on the safety security form as unauthorized drugs or paraphernalia. Yes, on the safety security form as self-harm. Yes, on the good catch form as an unsafe condition. No, this should not be reported. After all, it's Christmas. You're correct. We would need to report this on the safety security form as a disorderly person. Always do the right thing. An employee falls while working on the second shift and is suspected of breaking an ankle. She must be transported to the nearest ER for x-rays and further treatment. Which fall classification is the appropriate one to record this event? Fall, intercepted fall, unwitnessed fall, or none of the above is correct. Employee injuries are to be reported via a different process. Great work. None of the above is correct. Employee injuries are to be reported via a different process. Your supervisor and or the human resources director can give you more information related to this. However, there are situations where both a form for the patient and the staff member need to be completed. An example of this would be a combative patient. We would fill out a safety and security combative patient form in the event reporting system related to the patient. Additionally, we would fill out the human resources paperwork regarding a worker's injury for the employee involved. The employee involved would be, however, a witness on the event report reporting the combative patient. A new medication order was entered for a patient which included Oxycontin 10 milligrams twice daily. The patient's chart was reviewed by the pharmacist prior to verifying the order. The patient had a pain scale documented of zero and was not admitted with a pain issue. The pharmacist clarified the medication order with the physician and determined the order was entered by the physician under the incorrect patient. The order was discontinued before verification and the drug was never administered to the incorrect patient. How should this be reported? Medication fluid, specific event type med incorrect, good catch, near miss, Treatment procedure provision of care, other. Medication fluid, specific event type, med unauthorized. Medication fluid, specific event type, patient incorrect. This would definitely be a good catch near miss as the patient was never directly involved and this was all caught before anything re reached the patient. Which of the following statements about entering event reports is true? Write objectively. Describe exactly what you saw. If you didn't see the patient fall, document that you found the patient on the floor. Include patient and witness accounts of the event into the report. State their comments as direct quotes. Don't assign blame. Refrain from pointing fingers at coworkers, physicians, or administration. Just the facts. Or all of the above are true. You are absolutely correct. Every one of those things is true based on our everything that we have learned today during this presentation. A patient is given his drugs as ordered after mealtime. A short time later, the patient has a reaction. It is suspected that one of the drugs given previously may be the cause as one of them was a newly prescribed drug for this patient. What is the most appropriate way to record this event? Medication fluid, specific event type, contraindicated drug to drug. Adverse drug event, specific ADAT, ADE type adverse effect. Adverse drug event, specific ADE type drug to drug. Treatment procedure provision of care. You are correct. This would be adverse drug event, specific ADE type adverse effect. Thank you for spending the last hour with me to refresh your knowledge on our risk management program here at Encompass Health Rehabilitation Hospital of Spring Hill. After this presentation, you now know when and how to fill out an event report, your role in contributing to the satisfaction of our patients by addressing concerns, and how to be an integral part of our patient safety by embracing the facilities falls program. 
you have also been re-familiarized with the National Patient Safety Goals, regulatory requirements for abuse reporting, and how to set the standard in patient safety. Remember, we truly are stronger together.